the big, you know, most rule books, of course, are written by the designer. And the problem with being the designer and writing your own rule book is you know your game really, really well. And so things that you think are obvious and things that you think are clear are not gonna, not gonna come through. Um, but before we get into those details, um, just to kind of give a big, a, a kind of a general overview about writing rules. Um, how many of you here have actually tried to have written rule books? Okay. <laughs> uh, when I first, when I did my first game and I was ready to write the rules, I, you know, I had done computer programming for many, many years from like 1979 when I started my Apple II, trusty Apple II E. Um, and so I figured it was going to be really easy to write rules because I knew how to tell a computer to do exactly what I wanted it to do. And I figured that writing a rule book was basically a step-by-step -step process of going through. In fact, for my first game, I had even done flow charts of certain processes and things like that. And that was just the way I thought and the way I organized it. Um, but then when I actually sat down to write the rules, that first set of rules that I put together, which absolutely covered everything that was in the game, and I gave it to another human being to read, was completely incomprehensible to them. And um, it's the, the act of writing rules is not simply just conveying the information about how to play the game. Rule books do two very distinct things, um, or three or four, depending on how you count it, but certainly two very, very different things. Yeah, so yes. That. So um, I think the big challenge of a rule book, and uh, Jeff and I have slightly different opinions on this, but for me, my big thing about a rule book is, number one, it's uh, a reference. So every time you have a problem with something, you, wh what happens when you do this? You go to the rule book, you look it up. And when you're looking at a reference, you're expecting it to be A to Z. So starting with the setup, going on the, to the end of the game. So you expect everything to be in a logical forwards order. Problem is, rule books aren't just references. They're also tutorials. So the first time you open up a game, you look at the rule book, you want to know how to play. Well, how do you learn how to play a game? You start with how you win. How do you win? Well, we're going to go a step backwards. So to me, to write a good tutorial, you've got to go backwards. You've got to go Z to A. So a good rule book is A to Z and Z to A simultaneously. So that, is, to me, is the biggest challenge of writing a rule book, is making it work for both of those audiences. Make it, making it work for both the player who is learning the game for the first time, and making it work for the player who has to look up a rule and find out exactly where the rule is before that bowl of Cheetos runs out and everybody gets bored. Right. I mean, I think there's really three things that you're trying to accomplish with the rule book. One is to teach the game. Two is for people to look up questions uh, if they have some problems or something during play. And the third thing is when you go back to the game six months later or a year later and you take it out of the box as like a little refresher type thing of how do you get back into it without reading the whole, the whole rules. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in broad terms, uh, we put that into rules as reference versus rules as tutorial. Mm -hmm. And those two things are trying to accomplish very different things. Now, some game companies have started actually packaging two separate rule books in with the games. Um, one of the first ones that did that, in a sense, was Settlers of Catan, when it first came out, had the original, had the rules, and then it also, which was more like the tutorial and how to play, and then it also had the, um, uh, the almanac, they mm -hmm. called it, which was more, if you needed more detail about something or the full rules, that's where you went to. Uh, Fantasy Flight is very, very big on that. Fantasy Flight, like Imperial Assault, there's a, you know, this is your first game, here's a couple of missions, this is how you're gonna go through it. It's more of a narrative style and it goes through. And then there's another booklet that actually has all the rules. So they've taken this to heart in a way of actually dividing it up into two separate rule books. Some games have the luxury of doing that or, or wanna do that, and some you have to try to integrate it into a, a single document for people to digest. Shall we go to some examples? Sure. Okay, so uh, let's start with a rule book that to me, uh, I don't know how you feel about it, Jeff, but to me, um, the Galaxy Trucker rule book, to me, uh, is a fantastic tutorial and a great way to learn the game. And then the moment you have any questions, you have no idea where to look. Because, um, you know, they, it starts out with your first ship, you know, telling you how to build a ship, you know, how you immediately start. Um, and uh, there's all these uh, nice things that tell you how to play the game and then preparing for launch, but when it comes to looking something up, it becomes very tricky, especially because all the difficult, complicated rules they put towards the back, and you don't know whether to look in the front or the back for this particular rule book. And I think that's what makes this one a challenge. So they put um, a frequently asked questions at the end, which is nice and useful, but um, this is, uh, 
it's it's interesting because uh, there's also another uh, conversation about this rulebook that we'll get to later about humor in rulebooks. Uh, but for the most part, I think the challenge of this rulebook is, um, like for example, uh, when you're building uh, a ship and you make a mistake, uh, that rule is on page 13, whereas most of the shipbuilding rules are on pages two through four. You know, so that's one of the challenges, you know, of writing a tutorial rule book is, you know, you want to put the edge cases at the end with a tutorial, but in this case, as a reference, that becomes a lot trickier. Um, I want to jump to the opposite. Uh, this is the rule book to Gingopolis. Uh, Ginkopolis is actually set up really well as a nice reference, um, but as far as the tutorial is concerned, uh, there is a critical scoring rule, and that th goes back to tor tutorials, you want to know how to score in order to, to know how to play, because the scoring is going to inform a good play. There is this incredibly critical rule um, about endgame scoring, and it is on page 6. So when you start learning how to play, you know, you say overview and goal of the game. Um, you know, uh, at the end of the game, the player who accrues the most success points wins the game. Great. And then you start going through and you're like, well, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And finally, at the end of page six, after all this text, you get, oh, in each district, players compare the number of resources, the player with the highest number. Oh, that's what we were trying to do. And if you don't read that until the very end of the game, it becomes a very strange game. Um, I'll give another example. Uh, there are uh, these actions you can do, three actions. Uh, one is uh, called exploiting, one is called urbanizing, and one's called constructing. Um, and they put the exploiting action first, which for reference reasons I can understand, but for tutorial reasons, it's the least interesting action. So the fact that you lead with it means that when you're doing, reading as a tutorial, Oh, it's the first action, so this must be the most interesting, and it turns out it's the least interesting. So that's the tricky balance, and what I'm showing is not, these are not like amateur rule books, you know. These are not rule books that uh, were just slapped together haphazardly. There was a lot of thought and care that went into these rule books, but um, they had shortcomings uh, because writing a rule book is really, really, really hard. You know, and I think that's the most important thing. I see a lot of grousing online, people saying, oh, nobody writes good rule books anymore. I think it's safe to say nobody's ever written good. There was never a time when we knew how to rule, write a rule book, and now we don't anymore. In fact, I would say the rule books now, on average, are better than the rule books we've seen in the past. Yeah. Uh, but still, there are rule books that are challenging to read because writing a rule book is hard. Yeah, and people people are learning from mistakes. Um, Absolutely. I mean, CGE uh, Check Games, who mm -hmm. did Galaxy Trucker, um, another game, which I think is is a classic misstep. In, in this same direction in terms of tutorial versus references through the ages, um, which is a game that I love. It's a civilization building game. And in through the ages, there's actually, they start with a simple game and an advanced game and then a full game. And you're supposed to progress through each of those until you finally get to the full game. Well, it's fine, but it's the, the rules, for example, like the, how to resolve military actions are, are spread out over all three of those sections. So it's very easy to learn, but it's really bad as a reference. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's not one place where you can go and, and look up those rules. All the rules are there, they're just scattered all over the place. And in fact, in the new version of Through the Ages, which was just, just released uh, at Essen a couple of months, last month, um, now they have two books. They have that same simple advanced, advanced full game book, and they also have gone the route of now including the second book which explains you know, everything in more of a standard rules format, which is easy to, mm -hmm. uh, to look up. I'm gonna cheat a little bit and look at our, uh, at, at our yeah, notes well, over here. Yeah, if you wanna jump to my presentation, we can probably, I can. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah let's do that. Stuff. Yep, yep. I teach a course uh, on uh, board game design at NYU, and uh, just this week we did uh, rules writing, so it worked out really well for me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it says week 10. You guys have not actually been here that long. <laughs> 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 okay, you can. I, I will give you the uh, the control. Yeah, I'll just give some of these. For me. <laughs> oh yeah, this is fun. The mm -hmm. rules gets between you and the game playing the game. I just want to make it as painless as possible for people. I worked very hard on that graphic. I was very excited. <laughs> um, here we go. I've got, I've got it up here. Okay. Okay. So, is this a good rule? This is from Advanced Squad Leader. Um, 11.6 CC versus an AFV in order for a MMC to advance to a location containing a man unconcealed enemy AFV, it must first pass a PAATC, which causes the unit to become pinned. 
So how many Sorry. people think this is a good rule? Okay, I think this is an excellent rule. Okay, this is, this is a great rule if you know how to play ASL. This rule is fantastic. Okay, if you don't know how to play Advanced Squad Leader, this rule is a nightmare. Um, this, actually, the purpose of this rule is to explain when and how you're supposed to take a PAATC. This is the first time in the rules that the phrase PAATC is ever mentioned. That stands for pre-AFV attack test check, and AFV stands for armored fighting vehicle. Um, there's a glossary. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to, if you see PAATC, if you see any term you don't know, you're supposed to look it up in the glossary and that tells you what it is. Okay. Um, but it's, this is not hand-holding and stuff like that. The purpose of this rule book is not to teach you how to play the game. Um, they were actually having problems with their player base that they actually came out with subsequent squad leader games. There's now ASL Starter Kit Number 1, which is a separate game that you can buy, which is just designed to teach you the game. So that by the time you buy this three-inch binder of actual <laughs> ASL rules, you understand what this is. But if I already know how to play ASL, this is fantastic. I can look up PAATC in the index, it's going to send me to 11.6, and I know what all those terms mean, and if I know what happens if somebody's berserk who's charging into a tank, I know this is perfect. It gives me the information I need in like 20 seconds. And you see, that was a very clear decision that the editorial staffs made. Yes. They said, we are writing a reference. Yes, and that's what they, and that's what they did. So, you know, whether something's a good rule or not, it's, it's very subjective based on what you're trying to accomplish. So when you're doing the rules as tutorial, um, it's as if you're teaching the game. So you want to go through the sequence, and, and I'm sure most of us here have taught games, whether it's our own or other people's. So very important when you're teaching, as Gil said, is to give that overview of what you're trying to accomplish. And you gave a great example with Gengopolis. Mm -hmm. um, I've got one here for a game called Bomarzo, um, which I actually was just evaluating. Uh, that was one Stronghold brought back from Essen, and I was over at the house playing it. So I was in charge of teaching this game, so I had to read the rules <laughs> and then teach it to everybody. And it's about uh, these statues in a park in Italy. Apparently these statues are really famous, and they're really freaky-looking statues. <laughs> Um, and there, there's eight deities, there's eight gods, and um, you put them around the board. And most of the game is like, you read the rules, and most of the game is you, you, you do these actions, and most of these actions are, uh, will let you like turn food into stone, and do, do you know, basic actions like you would consider in a Euro game. Um, there also, you can get development cards, which give you special abilities, but you can also use development cards for another action, which is just listed in the book as this, as devotion. You see that little number four there? I don't know if you can see it, but in between, yeah, there, there's the number four. That number four, that's the devotion value on the card when you play it. And so this is the, this is the rules that were in the box, okay? The devotion score with Drago, the dragon action, you can put a card from your hand under a divinity card. You have these eight god cards that are spread out around the board. At the end of the game, you'll sum the devotion scores on the cards, and the divinity with the highest number will be placed in the first position between divinity cards. See end of the game section. That's the whole rule. So basically you stick these cards under and then something's gonna happen with that at the end of the game. Well, I was reading through these rules and this one just kind of stuck out at me. It just, I kind of glossed over it, but it didn't really make sense to me in the context I was talking about because everything else was about exchanging resources and using resources for different things. Well, it turns out that this is how you win the game. <laughs> the entire game is about this, okay? What this does is this orders the gods at the end of the game. Who's ever got the, you add those little white numbers under each god. Who's ever got, whichever god is the highest total, you put them then on another track, then the number one god down to the number eight god. And each god has something that it likes. Like one god likes who's ever got the most food gets the points for that god. And if it's a number one god, you get eight points for first place and four points for second place. If it's a number two god, you get seven points and six points or something like that. So the entire game is about these, these points and ordering these gods. If you're collecting food, you want the food god to get the most. But it never says that until the very, very, it doesn't even really say it on the very last page of the game. It just kind of says, oh, now you put these gods in order and you get points based on these little symbols. But that's really the only way that you get victory points in this game. So I was just, I was amazed by that, that they glossed over that. This is a classic example of, this is exactly the right rule. This is the rules of the game. You will not play the game wrong but it doesn't give you context to understand everything else. So actually I was interested because I, I, rather than scanning the rules, I went on BoardGameGeek to get, to get these rules. And there's actually two versions of the rules. This is the version that was in the box. Now on BoardGameGeek, there's a new version of the rules, which has this, because I guess they realized that they had a problem. 
And the first part is the same thing. Devotion scores a white number by using the dragon. You take it from your card and put it into the divinity. And now it says, at the end of the game, you'll determine the devotion values for each divinity by adding them up. The order of placement of the divinities around the board will be modified by the devotion value, with the divinity having the highest devotion value being placed in the first position. It's the end of game section. The higher the position of the divinity, the more VPs it can provide. So now they're trying to give you a little more information about the fact that this is kind of important for victory mm -hmm. points. But I, I still don't think they went all the way. You know, I still don't think they went as far as they should have. There should be a little overview section in the beginning of the rules that says, to win the game, you're going to want to, you know, these gods are going to be, you know, you use devotion points to make these gods favorited. Whichever one is the biggest favorite is going to give the most victory points to the person that the god likes the most based on their symbol or whatever. I wrote it very poorly there. But just <laughs> something like that in a very overview at the very beginning of the game mm -hmm. gives the players context for understanding everything else that goes on. And reading rules is hard. We all do it all the time. It's a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. And But the more you understand about how things slot into the actual sequence of play, the more sense that it's going to make and the easier it's going to be to digest what's going on. Yep, absolutely. So um, we'll move forward. So uh, when you have, uh, for that objective and overview, you want to put that at the very beginning of the rules because when players are sitting down and learn the game for the first time, they need to know what to do because that's going to frame everything in the game. That's going to frame, the, give the players their entire context for all their actions. Uh, it also means that uh, when you start uh, with the game, uh, when you start after the overview, you start at the highest level and you don't bring up edge cases first thing. You talk about like the main path and main trunk of what players are going to do. And then slowly as you keep going and keep, and keep giving more detail about the game, that's where the edge cases can start to come in. And that works both in terms of tutorial, uh, because you start with the main stuff, but it also works in terms of reference, because in terms of uh, references, generally you're not going to look very at the very top of a section for the edge cases. That said, if there's an edge case that comes up early in a game, um, like let's say at the beginning of each turn, you have to check for some condition, that can usually be tricky uh, to put in a rule book. Um, so, a couple of different options that we're talking about. So, we talked about this one already, the two rule, two rule book option, which is actually becoming more and more popular as, as, we, uh, as, as the game hobby expands. I have that settler's rule book at home and I totally forgot to bring it. That's, That's okay. I to bring that um, this is Dominion. Um, this is another layout option, um, which I call the reference column, which is used in a lot of Euro games where there's the main detailed rules and then there's a sidebar. Uh, yes. Yep. I could not find the English Dominion rules online. This mm -hmm. is Italian. <laughs> <laughs> um, but interestingly, they still use the ABC thing, that you do steps A, B, and C in order, even they don't work in Italian yeah. they do in English. <laughs> Action um, by. So this is really good. Uh, this taps into what we kind of glossed over, which is the idea that when you go back to a game uh, six months later, how do you remember it easily? Um, so by having that sidebar, this is the things you, you, your eye is immediately going to be drawn to that. and. The design, you know, you say, okay, the designer thinks these things are important, so that's what you're going to gloss over. It also helps you just kind of as like a mini index or table of contents thing. It's easy to scan over that and see what's going on. So this this is a useful layout method, I think, the, the reference column. Yeah, Alia does this uh, a lot also, Puerto Rico, Princess of Florence, and those are very good rule books also. You know, they will have that reference column. So just quick summaries of all the par of every paragraph on the right. So when you come back to it, or if you just need to quickly look something up and get the gist of it, it's right over there. Mm -hmm. uh, what's this other one that you put over, over here? Um, this is used in a much more complex game. So this is in a war game called uh, Triumph and Tragedy, uh, which was just released by GMT Games, which uses a similar concept. This is a three column layout. Two of the columns are the actual rules, and then the third column there is not just used to call things out, but that's like where all the illustrations are, the examples, the tables are all put in that third column. So, And they put them in nice different colored boxes, so it's very easy to kind of scan down there and pick up things. So. This is, this is a popular way of, of laying out rules. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's another way to uh, lay out rules if you've got a card game, uh, the card almanac style. And uh, that works, uh, this works when you've got like a core set of rules, uh, but every card sort of uh, does slightly different things. Um, and Lagranja, I haven't gotten to play Lagerheads. Oh, Lagerheads is your, your game. I'm that's plugging right. my own yes. game here, man. You're plugging your, yeah, that's nicely done, <laughs> nicely done. So, um, 
so this is a good way if you've got like a, um, a, a good chunky rule set, but then you've got cards that sort of add on to that rule set and do slightly different things. And for this slide or the next slide, um, Donald X. Valcarino, who made Dominion, uh, talks about, um, uh, a lot of us talk about theme and mechanism. To him, he views a third entity in that. He sees theme, mechanism, and data. And to him, data is what would go on, like, for example, an individual Dominion card. That would be a piece of data. Uh, so when he teaches Dominion, you know, you've got your core rules, but what each card brings is a piece of data. Um, and if you look at Flux, for example, from this point of view, um, Flux, the elevator pitch, is this is the game where every card changes the rules. But uh, from this lens, the rules for Flux don't change at all. The rules stay the same, but it's the data that changes from bit to bit. So from this lens, with a card almanac, you're given the game rules up front, and then you talk about the data card by card at the end. Um, and I like this style a lot, because yeah. uh, this is really starting with the core and then going to the edge cases, you know? Because rarely uh, is there something very critical on one card, because that's usually indicative of a game that has some issues. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, there could be exceptions, of course. Yeah, and in Loggerheads, um, which is, where I'm still prototyping it, but it'll be available to play three times tomorrow, <laughs> including 10 to midnight, which I'm very excited about. Um, Perfect time. Loggerheads is, is a, it's a game about a tavern brawl, and it's, it's fighting in a bar, and you can, you know, throw mugs and swing from chandeliers and jump up on tables and stuff like that, and push tables and things. And um, it's, it's played by just playing down cards that are the actions. So there's a throw mug card and things like that. And... So the way I structured the rules is the basic, it's kind of like three layers in the rules. So the, there's, there's core rules, which is in general how you move and how time works and how turns work and how you win the game. So that's the basic things. Then each card has on it the basics of what it does. It shows a little diagram of where you're standing and the squares that it affects and any basic stuff of what it is. Um, then at the back of the rules, there's a card almanac which is for every single card, it gives the details of that card. So any time that there was a weird little edge case, that's where I put it. Mm -hmm. So as an example, there's a card that lets you push a table. Um, and it says on the card, people that are standing on the table, this happens to them. People that the table gets pushed into, this happens to them. Well, there there's, are some weird cases, like what if the table's up against a wall? What if you're pushing it against another table? Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that on the card. The card just says the core stuff that happens all the time, but that information is in the almanac. Yeah. So it's a natural place for people to look because they just know there's, you know, they just see all the cards printed in the back of the rules and they can go back there and look at it. Yep. So I think it flows very nicely of having the, the core mechanisms and you just teach those and then people can jump into it. And then as they're looking at their cards, they see how the cards fit into it. Mm -hmm. And then if there's something they don't understand, they, they can look it up. I'm doing the same thing with the networks, actually. With the networks, that's going to have the back few pages are all going to be edge cases with cards. Uh, specifically, a lot of times you're going to use that uh, almanac to talk about how two specific cards interact. Because sometimes you'll have a card, save a card, uh, that allows you to pluck a card off from um, the discard pile. And then you've got another card that says if you just got a card from the discard pile, you can play it and send it to the discard pile. And then maybe you're going to want to clarify some sort of edge case that says you can only do this once, otherwise you have an infinite loop. You know, so exactly. that would be that would be the place to put that. Uh, whereas if you put it on the card, you risk putting a wall of text on the cards, and that's usually very very bad because uh, players' eyes will just glaze over and they'll never pick up the cards. Right. Or if you put it in the rule set itself, in the main flow of the rules. I'm just trying to look up a bad rule here. Um, <laughs> I'm not actually checking my mail. In the the thing. Um, if you put it in the main flow, it's going to interrupt things. You don't want to. You don't want to interrupt people's concentration. You don't want to give them a lot of these little details to worry about. You just want to give them the basics of it, but at the same time, make it easy to look up stuff if they, when they run into these uh, questions elsewhere. Okay. Shall I move on to distributed rules? Yeah, sure. Cool. Okay, so um, now this is, I've mentioned Dominion before. Dominion really falls into this category. Uh, this is a game where uh, the core rule set of the game is actually tiny. Like, Magic's core rule set, it's not that big. Dominion's core rule set, as Jeff mentioned, it's ABC, you know? It's not that big. Uh, action by cleanup. Um, but the meat of both of those games come from the cards and their interaction with each other. Uh, and so that's a game where we have distributed rules. And uh, both those games and Magic especially, I almost said especially, especially um, are very dense games, you know, and they, they have a lot of uh, really juicy possible interactions. And you can't put all of those interactions in the rules. 
uh, that would be an enormous rule book that would be impossible to reference and it'd be a useless tutorial. Instead, all those rules are on the cards and you only deal with them if the given cards come up. Right. Of course, Magic has an entire website do uh, dedicated <laughs> to uh, problems and weird interactions and things. So that's, that's a whole separate issue. When you have that many cards, I suppose, <laughs> we can give it's that inevitable. to them. Yeah, we can give it to them. Uh, what did I just do? Something happened. Okay, well, we're going to talk about programming instructions, so yeah, let's get to that. We're going to talk about that already. Yeah. A little bit. Okay. Uh, your computer. Yeah, something, something happened. Well, uh, uh, while, I, while I work on this, uh, while I, I be my own tech support, um, what was after programmed instruction? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, you know, the next thing we can probably go to is uh, talk about uh, what makes a good rule book in that case. Um, uh, so what, uh, I'm going to keep this up just, just for a little bit. So what do you think makes a good rule book? Well, before we get to that, I mean, if people haven't interrupted us with any questions or anything, they could, does anybody have any questions at this point before we move on to the, the other stuff? Okay. Um, I think when you're when you're looking at that, I mean, the next step then is of of how you actually write. Um, uh, well, I guess we, before we get to that, some of the other things we did have talking about, we, we want to talk about the cutesy, what I call cutesy mm -hmm. rules. Yeah. Oh right. yes, yes. Getting back to Galaxy Tracker. That's another, another yeah. thing that people use to try to make rules easy to understand. And yeah. Have a general layout. <clears throat> yeah. So. Um, so the question is, how much humor can you put into a game? You know, how how cutesy can you get with a game? With the um, rules, specifically. With, specifically with the rules, yes. Um, and the answer is not very. Per, at least this is for, for, for my point of view. When you get too far with cutesy and you put a lot of flavor into the rules, um, it winds up getting really distracting, and uh, players start to struggle with it. Um, uh, not a lot of rule books can get away with it. Um, uh, do you feel like there are some rule books that got away with it, Jeff? Um, again, you know, like uh, Space Alert tries to do this. It seems like CGE tries to do this a lot, but it, it yeah. can be totally overdone. Um, there, if the, the key thing again is not to interrupt the flow. Um, I recently posted. Uh, maybe your batteries are dead. Yeah, my battery's dead. <laughs> um, the. Um, uh, I, I recently posted uh, a, a question on Twitter asking people about their experience with bad rule sets, and and one of the games that came back uh, on the top of many people's list was this game, Return of the Heroes. Oh yes, I remember that. One. <laughs> <laughs> um, Return of the Heroes. The rules are actually a, a, a written as a dialogue between four different characters from the game, um, <laughs> and I've seen that type of technique used occasionally. Um, it's usually used in simpler games or sometimes it's used initially. I, there was, um, it was used in um, Mermaid Rain, the original version of Mermaid Rain used it and some other things. But it's, again, it's, it's, maybe it's great for teaching in a sense, but it makes it super duper hard if, at, to, to use it as a reference. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you want to get, again, think back to that slide of the rules being a roadblock between you actually playing <laughs> the game. And when you start adding this kind of fluff, it's good to have a little bit of fluff in the beginning to give yourself context, but um, but ultimately you want to um, you want to keep it to a minimum, and you just want to get to the meat of things and try not to get too cutesy. I think is a problem. How did you feel about Galaxy Trucker's rules, Jeff? Um, I was not a huge, super huge fan of Galaxy mm. Trucker mm. the rules. I mean, I, I I found them kind of because I, I and I recently had this experience where I was. Uh, meeting up with a friend and, and wanting to play it, and I hadn't played it in a long time, mm -hmm. and I kind of vaguely knew it, but there was some stuff I didn't, was, just didn't, was unclear on the details in terms mm -hmm. of setting up and stuff like that, and it was very, di very difficult for me to get through that part of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I find, some rule books can get away with it if you call out where the humor is. If you put it into like call out boxes, uh, put in little, uh, put it in italics, like uh, put it, indicate somehow, and I, it sounds really square, but I mean, I think it, call, it makes for a good rule book. You call it out as a joke, you know, and you, you let people know that this is not a critical piece of information. Because I think that's where the cutesy rule book stumbles, is you can't tell what's flavor and what's critical. And with a rule book, you really are interested in, in, the, in the critical. You're not really reading it for recreation. Right. So, okay. Oh, we got a question here? Sure. Yep. 
<laughs> I'll describe it. This will be fun. We'll try to figure it out. That was it. That was enough to, uh, to turn you off on the game. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it is another point that humor can be subjective, you know. And, but on the other hand, if you go too far in the other direction and you wind up being cheesy, then it's just not, it's just not fun, you know. And it winds up not being funny and nothing is worse than humor that's not funny, you know. Well, there are some things that are worse than that, but uh, I'd rather not get into those. Uh, but but the point is, if you if you're gonna try to be funny, then be funny, you know. Um, but if you go too far and you wind up being just coming off like a jerk, then how are you teaching the rules? You know, you're just sort of getting in the way. So I think these are all really valid things and reasons why humor in a rule book is really really tough. Yeah, and you know, look, the, the rule book ideally it's you know read once and then put away. I mean, it's just a means to an end. You know, that's not what's supposed to be entertaining. And most of the time, only one of the players is reading it anyway, out of five, you know, four or five or six players or what have you. So, um, so yep. So uh, let's you, yeah. Let's oh, let's you want to plug that back in. So oh yeah, that projector. that would work. Uh, so let's. Oh, there we go. Uh, so we are at layout options, and we can start yeah, the slideshow from the current here. slide. Skip down a couple there. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Give me one second. Trackpads are hard. Okay, distributed rules, programmed instruction, and cutesy rules. Yeah, we did that. And uh, beware. <laughs> yeah. That. All right. Now, Jeff, you know a lot about number cases. Yeah, I mean, I played a lot of war games. We saw that a little bit in the um, the rules for um, uh, Triumph and Tragedy, and also for Advanced Squad Leader is numbered cases. Numbered cases can be extremely useful if you're going to be doing a lot of cross referencing. I mean, if you're actually using them, you know, C rule 1.3.6, that can be really helpful if it's a complex rule. I wouldn't go more than three numbers down. Um, I'm actually working on a, a war game right now, and I ended up using this this type of numbering thing because it helped organize things and let you cross-reference easily. But I certainly wouldn't go more than two or three numbers down in, in your outline. That's just kind of a quick one. Yeah, yeah. And it does interrupt the the flow of the rules, and it's it, I I definitely find it hard to learn. You know, at that point when I see those, I'm I'm definitely like, yeah, this is really more of a reference. Um, so how should you line up your rules? I mean, I've got my own thoughts, but this, this falls in uh, pretty nicely. You know, starting up with the overview and sort of the theme of the game is not bad. I know some people, I know Rich Summer on his short-lived podcast hated flavor text and rule books, you know, <laughs> and he would talk, you know, against it. And I, I can see why. If you need, like, a one-page short story to get people right. into the game, I think your game has a thematic issue. Because uh, the theme should be coming out of the gameplay, but that's that's a separate argument. Um, but yeah, a, 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 like a paragraph or so to get to get people into like what the theme of the game is is, is useful. And then the objective, and the objective is different than the overview because the objective tells you what you're trying to do. Like, what's the object of the game? How are you getting to the object of the game? Uh, and uh, is this a cooperative game? So there's one rule book I saw for a cooperative game, but it never actually said it was a cooperative game. And this drives me crazy. It, it did actually, no, I tell a lie. This is, I think, a four page rule book. I have it here, but I'm not going to show it because it's from a small uh, publisher, and I don't want to do that with a small publisher. You can come but, up after we'll show it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we embarrass them later. But uh, on a four page rule book with no diagrams, pretty dense text, it was on page three mentioned in passing. Like on like the items paragraph. Oh, you'll want the items because you win as a team. And that's where it's hidden. That's the only place where you see where it's a... You don't want to put that there. You want to put that in the objective. The object of this game uh, is to defeat the game. The players work together as a team. You know, something like that. And then then we know what we're trying to do. Um, Jeff, you put contents. Uh, that's the contents I, of the box. Yeah, that's I, I would say components. components but yeah, yeah. I say components. yeah, totally. But but yes, the components are good for two reasons. Number one, obviously, is a manifest to decide because uh, you know most people will not say, oh well, we got to stop and figure out we got exactly the right number of cubes before we start. Most people aren't going to do that, but it is useful because later on you might say, uh, okay, grab a starter card. What's a starter card? Let's go to the components. Oh, that's a starter card. You know, and that's where your uh, components right. are good. All in one place. 
nice. Very yes. easy to find. Yep. Uh, then we've got the setup, and uh, the setup should have tons of diagrams. This is the most visual part of the rule book for me. And this, I've noticed, I mean, I've been playing games for a long time, and, and I've noticed this as one of the biggest changes in rules book, especially over the last five years. Now, just about every game has the full two-page spread, color spread, showing exactly how everything is set up with numbers going around. It seems like a lot of games are kind of converging on sort of best practices, and that's definitely one of them, to have a very clear setup. Yep, yep, because the nice thing about that is it tells you the order that you set everything up in and where it goes on the board, and just gives you an indication of what the game should look like once it's set up. And all those things are really, really super useful. Uh, then comes the general flow of play, and this is critical because there's all these questions, you know, uh, do we each get one action on a turn? Do we even get turns? Is this real time? If we get three actions on a turn, uh, do we d each do one thing at a time and then move on to another thing? Like, is it phased? There's all these different ways to do it, and this is where you would say uh, what each player does and how the turns and flow of play generally works. Uh, then if you have actions that you break down, this is where you start breaking them down. And again, if you have edge cases, be very very careful about putting them here. Like, I'd say if you have an edge case, I'd almost put it in a callout box uh, instead of like just putting it in the flow of rules, because then if you're trying to get, learn the rules as a tutorial, you might get hung up on this edge case, which turns out to rarely happen. Um, so that's, uh, these are all things that are um, just, just make learning the game from the rule book really, really difficult. Um, after the general flow of play, that's when you can start drilling down and get into the detailed sequence, and that's where you can start chewing on those corner cases. Um, end of game, I mean, it seems like a no-brainer that you put that at the end. I've seen some rule books put the end of game on the second page. Yeah, when and, ends, yeah. yeah, and uh, that is really, really hard because, oh, what? Uh, so uh, what's the tiebreaker? I don't know. Let's go. And you, you immediately go to the end of the page, and you then do the rule book, and you don't find it at the end of the rule book. Uh, then you go to, like, page two, and you find it on page two just after setup, you know? Uh, so points to them for, you know, telling you how to win, but uh, the actual full end of game stuff should be at the end, especially all the tiebreakers, if your game has tiebreakers. Like, I wouldn't put the tiebreakers up front. Uh, just say, in general, you win the game by having the most points, and then at the end, if multiple players have the most points, then the tallest player wins, or in my case, the shortest player. <laughs> yeah, and um, the, the, just one way to think about all this kind of coming, yes? then you can certainly put it in there. Yeah. That's fine. If this is a, a shorter game, like a simpler game, um, then you have a little more play over here, you know, because uh, if everything's on one page, it's very easy to scan it out, you or know? you can repeat it at the end if you want to put it in both places. Mm -hmm. That's totally fine. Repeating something's not necessarily bad. You know, obviously what it's you're doing is... It's pain in the neck when you're editing it. you got to yes. change it in two different places. But. And also it makes it a tougher tutorial because you're reading everything twice, yeah. you know? Um, it's good for reference, bad for... And you see, like, every a lot of the stuff... I won't say everything, but a lot of the stuff winds up being a scale, you know? Uh, sometimes uh, a change you make is going to make it a better reference but a worse tutorial, or vice versa. Yeah, and, and this all goes into kind of the theories about the way people learn. And, you know, if you have context to put things into, it's going to be a lot easier for you to pick something up. If you just like that Bomarzo example in the beginning, that's a random, that's just a random rule in the middle of something. Oh, this is something else I can do. I can tuck numbers under. Okay, it's easy to understand. But if you don't have the context to put it into, it's going to be very difficult to remember. You're asking people to remember a lot of information in a very short period of time. This is also, and this goes back more to the design. By the time you're writing the rules, the ship has already sailed. But theme can be such a powerful force for helping your players to learn the game and having their expectations coincide with the way the theme works. You know, if I'm designing a pirate game and there's an action to get more cannons, people are going to naturally think that, okay, if I'm buying more cannons, my ship's going to be able to, it's going to help me attack other ships. Mm -hmm. If buying more cannons in your game makes your ship go faster, you're going to have to explain that. It's going to be very hard for people to remember. So you want to use your thematic elements in a natural way. And if it goes against your theme, which can happen sometimes, um, and you'll pick, hopefully pick that up in playtesting, you've got to make sure to highlight it or, or to change it around a little bit so it fits more with people's expectations. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, sometimes when you're writing, now um, we're going to jump into a, like, I just want to jump to a very quick design thing. Sure. Um, got, there's uh, a... Yeah, yeah. So a quick design thing. Um, there's a question of whether you write your rule books uh, early or late. And we have a little bit of a divide here. 
So uh, why don't you start, Jeff? I like to write my rule books as early as possible in the process. Um, I, I find, for me, that it helps to clarify my thinking about the rules. It helps to me to learn, think, think of those edge cases, and we're going to jump into the, some of the, the more nuts and bolts, the tactical stuff of writing rules in a second. But you know, it, it helps me say, OK, when I'm writing the rules, that's when I start to think about, well, what happens if this is a tie? What happens if I have to draw a card, but there's no more cards? What happens, you know? And that helps me do it. The other reason that I like to do it is if it's hard to write a rule, and sometimes it's hard to write a rule, if it's hard to actually write down the rule that you have in your head in a way that's explainable, that's a sign that there's something wrong with your rule. Yeah, it's a canary in the coal mine. And you should go and try to change it. I mean, as an example, and this is the one I wanted to bring up, this one's from Magic also. This rule is, um, there was an ability, I forget the name of this card, oh, Dead Ringers was the name of the card. And this is the, the way the text is written. Destroy two target non-black creatures unless either one is a color the other isn't. <laughs> okay, so that's, you know, and that's probably given what it is, and that's mainly the reason I had to write it that way is because creatures can be multiple colors, which makes things funky. Um, the fact that they had to write it that way is a sign that that's probably a bad ability to include in the game, and you should change it. Yeah. Um, but you have a different yes, feel. Yes, I have a different feel. I feel, well, I, the way I like to do is I like to write rules late. Um, I catch um, a lot of that cringe stuff during uh, testing. And when I say cringe stuff, I mean, I personally find if I'm ever cringing when I mention a rule, there's a problem with the rule. Have you ever done that? Like you mention a rule and you're like, oh, but if you're cringing internally, that's a sign that it's a bad rule. So likewise, if you're um, in Jeff's position, you like to write the rule book early. And I should mention, these are both very valid positions. I don't think either one is wrong. But if you like to write the rules early and you're writing out and you're cringing as you write it, there's probably a problem with the rule. Uh, so for me, I generally catch those. Anyway, I find that uh, uh, you know, I, I have a really hard time with diagrams, especially. Um, with rule books. Uh, they take me a very long time. There's a lot of swearing involved. And there's so much work, and I generally am very iterative, uh, maybe more so than other designers, when I test. Um, I really like to swap things out and experiment and change things. So writing rule books is really painful for me early on because everything's going to change. And everything's going to change over and over and over again. So I personally, I, you know, I will write outlines and I will remind myself, I'll give myself overviews. This is generally what I want to do. But an actual rule book, I will save until very late in the process. You know? And I think that's a valid way of going about it, but it really depends on how many times you get to play test. I mean, generally, the more you get to play test, the more luxury you have in writing your rule books late. Um, and also, um, how complex your game is and you know, how much uh, iter iteration you tend to do in your games. Yeah, it's a totally valid way. And I mean, it, it goes hand in hand with, which I totally believe a philosophy in terms of prototyping is invest as little time as possible in your prototypes effort. Don't make them look pretty because you're going to throw stuff away. Early you're on, you're not going to yeah. want to throw stuff away if you've spent a lot of time on it. So if you spend a lot of time writing the rules, you're, you're going to be much less likely to chuck a rule. Yeah. Um, just a, a quick, you know, but one thing that helps me do that is I use a tool for rules writing. I use Scrivener to write my rules. Um, it's, it's designed for, you know, writing novels and lots of other things. But basically, everything's like little note cards. And you can totally rearrange them, and you can chuck them out. So I find by having it in these little note card chunks in the computer, it's easy for me to reorganize my rules, and it makes it much less painful to take an entire section and throw it out because everything else is there, and it's just just yeah. a lot simpler. Yeah. You want to talk briefly about index before we? Uh, I think go if on? a game has more than like twelve to sixteen pages, you should go to you should have an index or tables of contents at the beginning. There should be something that helps you look it up. There, I, I would definitely encourage that. All right. Um, so, writing crisp rules, uh, consistent terminology, uh, the same word every time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, if you say, uh, like, I, I'm finding some things, I'm proofing and testing the network's rule book now, and there's a basic game, and uh, there's times when um, I call it an introductory game, and other times when I call it a beginner game. And those are all things I need to find a consistent way to call it, because otherwise it gets confusing. Yes. Yeah, and it's it's hard to do that. So you got to make sure that you, especially if you're using common terminology, you got to make sure you go through and, and do it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is using terminology that you expect that your players will understand in a way that you think you will understand them. I read a rule book recently that said, um, you know, that there's there's a tableau of like ten cards out in the middle of the table, and it said draw a card from the face up ones. Now to me, draw that kind of just hit me weird because yeah. draw to me means draw a random card from a face down stack of cards if I'm picking from face up series of cards does that mean 
I have to kind of pick one at random, or it should have been like select a card. Exactly. As an example. Yep. Yep. Uh, and uh, and uh, yes. Yes. Uh, because we've all seen games where the designer invents some crazy terminology that they call they 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 want to they don't call it points they call it whatever mm -hmm. and it just it just makes me nuts. Those yeah. Things. Definitely. Definitely. Um, Think about edge cases. Uh, now, this a lot of this will come out in play testing, uh, and it's one of the reasons why you want to test your rule books. But um, your uh, edge cases have to be mentioned in your rule book. Now, I've been advocating to put them uh, relatively late in your rule book, and I still feel that way. But um, they have to be there because they're going to come up. Uh, now, a, a lot of times, where they where you put the edge case is kind of tricky because a lot of times edge cases come from the interaction of two mecha mechanical components. So uh, if you have an edge case where mechanical component A messes with it, mechanical compo compo component B, there's going to be a question of where do you put it? Because if you put it at only one place, people are going to look up in the other place. Like for example, like let's say uh, you have a mechanism where the game ends on, uh, say, the third time the draw deck runs out. But let's say there's an action that people can take where they, they can just um, uh, empty the draw deck, you know, and, and uh, would the game end but if the player takes the action three times? You know, where do you put that? That's a terrible example, but hopefully, you know, you, you're, it's it makes sense that you where do you put it? Do you put it in one or the other? Uh, one good thing to do in that case is sometimes uh, just to put a marker and say, uh, and if there's like a long explanation for that, uh, you can say, uh, see uh, this other section of the rule book for edge cases or some more elegant way of putting that. Okay. Yeah. Why don't we just jump ahead a couple? We don't minutes, get to so. assume people are idiots? Well, <laughs> everyone saw that, I'm sure. Assume people are idiots. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. Um, yeah, you have to proofread your rule book. I have a rule book here. Um, this is a phenomenal game. I love this game, Kolund Colony. I think it's an incredible game. But um, this is uh, probably the second worst rule book I've seen in the past five years. And the worst rule book I've seen was the game just before this, that was the first part of this game's trilogy, uh, where he had absolutely no idea what was going on. But um, I, I'm not going to bring up the monitor anymore, but I have a bit over here where it tells you that you start with four coins, and then I have another bit a few pages later where it tells you start with five coins. So you, ha you need eyeballs on your rule, rule book for things like that. You know, How much money do you start with? You just have to go it over and over and over again. And the more eyeballs you have on your rule book, the better. Yeah, and there's plenty of people that would be more than happy to you could give you constructive or non-constructive advice on your rules and how they're put together. Another thing, if you can do it, and I think you were actually trying to do that here, right, with the networks, is, yes. is a blind play testing where you don't teach the game. Um, I, I made that mistake in one of my games, is I basically taught the game the whole time. We only did like one or two where we actually sent the whole pack off and had people do it. Um, because you, it's when you're explaining it, you tend to gloss over stuff that's maybe not in the rules. You don't pick up the fact that you're it's not there. You want if you want people to try to learn the game and play the game from your rules. The difficult part is if it's a longer game with a more complex rule set, it's hard for you to sit there and just watch them do it and then play the game. Um, so most of the time, you get a session report back, and you have to either read between the lines in the session report or talk to them about how they played to try to pick up on any rules mistakes that they made, but that's a real tough process. So I know that, that here you're trying to actually do a thing where you're handing the whole package to the players mm -hmm. and saying, read the rules, learn the rules, I'm gonna just watch you do it, yep. which is incredibly valuable if you have the opportunity to do it, but it's also really, really hard to organize on a, on a more complex game. Yeah, especially because most of your friends will have already played your game. And you need people who have not yet played your game, you know, because you need to see that first shock of, where, where do I look in the rule book for this? Because I don't know the rule, you know? Um, it's really hard to do also because your first impulse is to help them. And you have to suppress that impulse and just <laughs> let them flounder, yes. you know? Um, what makes it really hard is, um, is uh, if it's a, a more complicated game, uh, a, most people don't go for a really complicated game and just learn it right from the rule book. They'll already have read the rule book before, and that can be tough to simulate. So you have to sort of, uh, sort of keep an eye on that and uh, have an idea of, um, well, how realistic is the scenario? But that said, you know, people should figure out your rule book 
from reading it, you know, if it's in front of them. It might take some time, but they should eventually get the rules right, you know. And it's important in that blind test to have as little interference as possible. And if they're playing a rule wrong and it doesn't really mess that much with the game, let them play it wrong, you know. Maybe they'll find out in five minutes, wait, this seems weird. Let's, oh, this is, that's why. And you want that moment to happen to see how long it takes, how much friction it generates, and that sort of thing. You only want to, I'd say, teleport. You only want to teleport into their room briefly, you know, if the play test is really going south. Okay, we will end on this. Yes. Um, so what is, uh, can anyone know, tell me what the hardest rule error to find is? Yes. The rule that is not there. <laughs> um, that is, you know, I've, I've done my own rule books and you read them over and over and over again and it, if the rule is there and it's just not written clearly or, you know, there's just something that's not right, but if there's a rule that's easy to find and fix, it, not easy, but easier, if the rule is just not there at all, like the number of points somebody starts with or mm -hmm. something little like that, what happens at the end of a battle, it's really hard to figure that out because you don't have anything triggered. And that's why those, those other elements can, um, uh, can be so important to get it out into blind play testing and have people look at it for you to point those things out. All right. We are out of time. Yeah, I think we're out of time. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, if well, we have I'm any around, questions. so if, yep. you, if anybody wants to ask me questions, yes, now, or if you want to meet in the hallway, that would be fair. That yep. would be totally fine also. I'm not rushing off. So. Awesome. And good luck with your rule books, and remember that what you're doing is impossible. <laughs> <laughs>